in the 70s an idea developed that there were actually three types of what's called learning modalities. You've probably heard them. You are either a visual learner, an auditory learner, or a tactile learner. And today I'm going to talk about the fourth modality that I think is really coming of age right now, and that's digital. Students today are learning in a completely different method than what they used to learn. My mom's a kindergarten teacher, and every year we would go and help her clean up her classroom at the end of the year, and at the beginning of the, and at the, beginning of the year. So every June and every August, we're in her classroom helping clean up. She has four huge metal filing cabinets filled with worksheets and books, art projects, music projects, just stuff that she's collected over her 20 plus years of teaching. And when I was in school, um, I always had a, my backpack from sixth grade to all the way through high school, could weigh up to 50 pounds on any, any given day. Had to carry it to every single class. That was my education, 50 pounds on my back. Today, all of these are totally obsolete. Students have smartphones, tablets, and laptops to carry around the, the entirety of human knowledge in their pocket. Everything that they need or want to know can be found online via ebooks, audio files, YouTube videos, anything. They can carry it all in their pocket. They can have the entire course load on one device. It's all digital. A lot of these schools in Hamilton County, specifically, have Mac labs. They have a classroom or five classrooms of nothing but Mac computers. And the students come in and they sit down. And anybody guess what they use that $3,000 piece of equipment for? Taking pictures and fixing their lip gloss. <laughs> they have all these resources, but they don't know how to use them. Chattanooga is an innovation hub, or getting an innovation district. We have the gigabit internet. We're one of the luckiest cities in the country. But what are we doing to actually innovate these schools and drive this growth? We do have the STEM school. I won't say that Chattanooga is completely ignoring the future. We do have one school, the STEM school. Um, they just use the gigabit network to send HD 4K images of microorganisms directly into a biology class. The students have live access to researchers and microscopic images, observations and knowledge while also enabling them to control the microscope from over 1,800 miles away. They had access to real world knowledge and interaction with professionals, and they could ask questions with somebody in the field with current knowledge because of technology. They're not using a book that was published in 2010 and 2015. They weren't just given a resource and said, there you go, figure it out. Or a 45 minute training session in a worksheet say, well, if you can't, just you can call us, they're gone. And that tends to happen with smart boards. When smart boards were first being implemented in Georgia, a primary school was out <coughs> with a smart board in every single classroom. All those teachers were required to travel 45 minutes to another city to sit in a college lecture hall and have a 45 minute lesson with somebody who handed them a worksheet and walked out. She didn't even lecture, she didn't answer any questions. That was her teaching. For, that was her training for the teachers who are supposed to use this brand new piece of technology to teach little kids. That's not using technology. That's giving somebody the resource and saying, go for it. STEM school's not doing that. They're, giving, they're bringing teachers in that have the background and they're giving the teachers the training that they need to succeed so the students succeed. So every cog is working together. It's not a teacher up giving a lecture, giving a lesson. It's like co, uh, like innovative in teamwork. So when they have a, pro a problem or a question, then a teacher goes back to them and says, "You figure it out." Mm -hmm. So they, when they go into school, they all build a robot together. The teacher, if it's the first year, it's the first time they're building a robot, so they're all figuring out together. And I think that's what's the opportunity for tech to create in our schools. Now why do you think this isn't being implemented in more schools in the county? School culture. I think the principal at the STEM school is amazing and able to create this culture where they're not teaching to the test. He has the autonomy himself to create autonomy in the students, so there isn't that pressure that there's on other principals or other teachers to get those scores up, get 
get get going, meet these metrics, he's able to kind of throw that out and says, you know what, if we focus on this, we're going to be fine on the test. Right. So I think he's able to create that culture, school culture with principals is huge. What about those students who might not even have internet at home? How do we embrace those kids and how do we start start getting those resources to children who might be behind technologically because the only internet that they can access is on a cell phone that's connected to a cell phone network and it's really slow and limiting and not enough for them to even just do their homework, let alone start learning sophisticated technology. That's a very good point. Our Boys and Girls Club that have internet access that are open to students, there's a library that they can access within given time periods. Um, Chattanooga has a city-wide Wi-Fi, so if they do live within the city area, they can access it that way. And as far as them owning cell phones and having smartphones, I do work with a lot of the underprivileged schools, some of the lower-end schools at Brainerd and Howard, and those kids have so much to give. And they are so intelligent, and they are so creative. And they have all the resources. They have a Mac computer lab with the full Adobe Creative Suite. But they're not being given enough of an opportunity and enough of a, enough funding. They, they don't feel like they are cared about by the county to want to perform well. So like the Howard School, they're one of my favorite schools. <laughs> Terry Ferris is actually an old media professional and he's the media teacher there. He tries so hard to work with those kids. That's their favorite class when they come in there. The majority of them do have smartphones, or if not a smartphone, they have an iPod touch, so they can still access the internet, um, to go back to the, the internet access. The majority of them, I think there might be one in the entire class that doesn't have one. And he works so hard with those kids, and they do really well in his class, because they are learning something that is enjoyable to them. He asks them questions, he doesn't test them, like aggravating amount of time. He does his coursework, but he also engages the students. So I have a lot of old guard, older personnel who just don't have that relationship with technology and, and don't see how it plugs in and can affect the, the newer generation that, that's, that's coming up. Um, what, do you, what do you do with that? And do, do you wait for younger people to Kind of emerge. Why well, wait? Places, or, they can learn. Well, then you got you got tenure and everything. Too. Oh, oh, but also you have. Uh, I think even if you, you show the teachers how to use the equipment, if, if they don't have that beyond the classroom relationship with it though, too, I don't think they're going to go above and beyond. Just like the the, the the school that you mentioned, where these people get it, they identify the need, they can articulate it and then break it down in a way that other people can see it, where it takes the pressure off of having to worry about a test. I think if you if you lack that relationship with yourself, you obviously aren't going to, to implement that in and outside of your classroom. They're used to somebody sitting down, talking, laying things out very plainly, having a list, having a checklist. They're used to a certain type of learning. So you have to actually incorporate old methods to teach them new methods. It can be done. It absolutely can be done. I work with a lot of older teachers. I think that something that we might all struggle with with social media is kind of that divide between having like alone time and downtime um, versus kind of being engaged on your phone and always like looking at what everyone else is doing all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think having that space is really important. Um, and I see this in kids, you know, there, there's just this less and less as people get younger and younger, there's this inability to just have this space. Um, and in that space, there is creativity and there are things that go on in your brain. Um, you solve problems, you, it, it's like working things out in your subconscious, but when you're engaged with something, um, you can't. And then on the flip side of that, um, I watched many documentaries. One um, is about teachers and how their days are longer and longer and there's just more and more for them to do. So that kind of limits their ability to separate and have their space and time for their families or for themselves or whatever because they have to have this online presence. And then kids are getting more and more homework. Um, I can't remember the name of it, I'm sure I'll remember it as soon as I walk out of here, but there was a documentary on Netflix about a dad 
who um, started doing his kids' homework, and he couldn't keep up with it because there was so much. And these kids were in like fifth grade. They're not even high school kids, and they had three hours of homework every single night. I think that it kind of it muddles things a bit. I'm seeing this in my work life and in my personal life, so I'm wondering how educators deal with that as well. Here's the, 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 the teaching and the homework and having the dad help with the homework and end up doing it and he can't keep up. That's not engagement. That is overloading a student. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as engagement. Engagement to me is having a conversation with a student. And as far as turning off, I feel like that's a generational divide. The students are 100% comfortable being plugged in. That is their day to day. That is their normal, to be constantly plugged in, to always be on their phones. It's a problem in classrooms because the teacher wants to connect with the student, but the student's more interested in IMing on a Mac computer that they're supposed to be working on something else, or they're on the phone, or they're doing stuff. They are, that's their normal. So as far as the generational divide, the teacher has to set boundaries and rules for themselves. If my teacher is only taking emails between Seven or uh, between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. because that is the time that she said I need to get my answer submitted and I can't be mad when she doesn't answer my question at 2 o'clock in the morning. Okay, I think um, you're right. You do need to be mindful of that. I mean, the research, and this is looking at Thomas Gesky, it takes about three years for a teacher's practice to change, mm -hmm. regardless of the modality that you're looking at, whether it's through digital something through face-to-face, -face. and I'm a professional development provider, so I'm always working with the educators that are just, I mean, some of them are fearful of computers and some of them are fearful of just having students running around the classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, it can be anything and everything, um, but, it, but it does take time to change, and so, yeah, there's the why wait, but there also needs to be some patience, too. Not because of fear, just because to develop these habits and to do it well. Because it's one thing to actually use it, but to actually teach is, is another um, is another investigation. Absolutely.